Loved ones, Management 3130. This video is, uh, would capture session 20. If we were face to face, and Lord knows I wish we were, the class would be 17 July, 2020. In terms of admin stuff, uh, nothing to share with you. I uh, largely am caught up on grading and other sorts of exchanges like that. Today we're going to look at chapter 14, which is a chapter that speaks to power and influence and leadership, and there's a ton of good stuff. And partnered with this video presentation, there's another video presentation that's already on the YouTube channel. It's entitled Leadership and Overview, and I really want you to see that, um, indeed, as, as part of this. Uh, you'll see that there's an attendance verification question for that as well. Um, the um, the link, I, I filmed that particular session in the spring of this year. I don't remember if it was April or May, but just a couple of months ago. Uh, it is still timely and the content is still excellent. Um, but um, there's a link under the PowerPoint presentation button. If you go to our, our folio page and you look at the content, there's a, one of the modules that says PowerPoint presentations. And if you simply click on that button, it will show you the link to take you to the video, just the, the time and, and the title, that sort of a thing. So please understand that today is a, a presentation of chapter 14 of the text, and as a companion presentation, there's this uh, leadership uh, overview on, uh, on the PowerPoint, forgive me, on the YouTube channel. Um, just a quick backstory on the, uh, the other uh, video presentation. It's actually a PowerPoint presentation. I've had the extreme good fortune to teach leadership for the entire time I've been in academia. I even did it as a, as a doctoral student, and I'm blessed by to have that opportunity. Um, years ago, um, probably 20, 22 years ago, I was given the uh, responsibility to develop a leadership course for the MBA program at the University of Louisville. And uh, it, it did not exist. We, were, we as a faculty were sort of radically improving the curriculum. And we were convinced that uh, our MBA students should all have sort of a significant immersion in leadership because it is such a, such a powerful domain. And, and we use it everywhere. We use it in families and social settings and volunteer organizations and businesses. Leadership is pervasive. It's really everywhere. So I developed uh, probably a two hour, 45 minute or three hour module for that, uh, for sort of the introductory class of the MBA uh, program. And then I, I started teaching leadership at the undergraduate level as well. And although, although the objectives are the same, my classes are an hour 15 max rather than two hours and 45 minutes. So I sort of, uh, I didn't just cut things out. I, I, I looked at it thoughtfully and I redefined uh, the content. What should I present? So I just wanted to share with you what the significance of that uh, that uh, PowerPoint presentation is. It, it, it was born as, it started life as, um, uh, an introductory uh, session for an MBA class in leadership. And several years ago, I mean, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I, um, I altered it, I modified it in meaningful ways so that it would fit in an undergraduate environment. So I really think it's good stuff. Uh, that is for you to decide, but uh, it is a responsibility of yours. Today's video and then this companion video it's entitled Leadership and Overview. So, uh, today's AV story, attendance verification story. About 15 years ago or so, uh, the Norton family, this branch of it, was living in Southern Indiana because I was on the faculty at the University of Louisville. And many of you may know that Louisville is a river town. It sits right on the Ohio River. Indiana's to the north, Kentucky's to the south. And probably 45, 50% of the people who worked in, in Louisville, Kentucky, indeed lived on the Indiana side of the river. Uh, real estate was 15, 20% less expensive. Public education was excellent. The commute wasn't long. So many of us, many of us who worked in Louisville lived on the Indiana side. And that described, that described my family. So we as a family, uh, this would have been probably all four of us, um, my son, my daughter, and uh, my wife and myself. We're going into our favorite pizza joint, a little place called Pizza Inn. They had a choo-choo train that ran around the dining room and delivered drinks. It doesn't take much to make me happy. 
So we're headed into Pizza Inn, park the truck, walking across the parking lot. Now, before I tell you the, the, the sort of the specifics of this story, I want to remind you of something, something that you realize. Uh, you may not think of it consciously unless you're a car guy or a car girl. All vehicles, all vehicles have an acoustical signature. When they pass by, there's some noise that, that uh, trails them in their wake. And, and some acoustical signatures are very recognizable. Uh, for example, a lot of performance cars have aftermarket exhaust systems. Uh, I promise you, I can pick out a five liter Fox Body Mustang at a distance of three quarters of a mile because the acoustical signature is distinctive. It's recognizable to those of us who are attuned to that. So we're walking into the Pizza Inn and I hear behind me, I hear a truck accelerating away from a traffic light. And I stopped and I said, sweetheart, to my wife, to my loving, precious wife. I said, sweetheart, the truck that's accelerating behind me is a crew cab Dodge 2500. It has the Cummings diesel engine and a five-speed transmission. And she looked at me, not with a glare, but she said, you think you're big stuff, don't you? And I said, I'm right. I promise you if I turn around, I'll see a 25. The reason I said 2,500 is three quarters of the Dodge diesels were three quarter ton rather than one ton. I knew it had a diesel because they have a recognizable acoustical signature. I knew it had a five speed because I heard the driver shifting. So not, not necessarily rocket science, but my wife said, you think you're big stuff, don't you? And I said, baby, I nailed it. I got it right. And she said, okay, special man, what color is it? So, let's talk about leadership. Chapter 14, Power, Influence, and Leadership. I think the reason that the chapter is entitled Power, Influence, and Leadership is really twofold. The first is, you can't, you can't understand anything about leadership unless you understand how we, people in leadership roles, use power to influence outcomes. You simply can't understand them because of their interconnectedness. The other thing that's true is the, the prototypically excellent definition of leadership. There are millions of them. But the best one comes from a bright scholar named Gary Eukel. We've talked about this, you and I. And, and Eukel defines leadership as a process in which an individual, that would be the team lead, intentionally influences a group of collaborators, that would be the team, to accomplish some group task, some shared purpose. So the definition of leadership has influence in it. And, and the definition of power, this almost tickles me. This is tautological, it's almost circular. Uh, the definition of power, literally, in the context of organizations, not power as it relates to you lifting weights, not power as it relates to torque on a vehicle, but, but um, or, or the power of a laser, but power in an organizational context is best defined as the ability to influence outcomes. So we define one word with the other. Okay, that isn't scary, but again, the definition of power is the ability to influence outcomes. So this, this connectedness between power, influence, and leadership, it is literally impossible to separate them. It is, it is impossible because the very definition of leadership embraces the verb influence. So, um, I want to talk to you I want to put this on the board, actually. <clears throat> Power can exist in a structural or an organizational context, and we will probably talk about that later today. I want to talk to you right now about personal power, power that resides in an individual. So about, um, what would this be, 60 years ago, two psychologists, their last names were French and Raven, in 1961, published a paper, it wasn't a big one, and they said, we believe that power that flows from an individual comes from five sources. So let me put the French and Raven five sources of power typology on the board. It's just a, a little classification system. So here are the five 
five sources. This is the French and Raven 1961 typology. A typology is simply a framework that is meant to classify anything. Um, they say that power may be legitimate, and I'll, I'll talk about each one of these five in a moment in a way that I hope you understand well. Legitimate power, reward, reward power, the, the, the coercive power, expert power, I know it has two E's, but I'm saving time and money. If I, if I don't put an extra letter on the board, we get to save these Expo Drive Race Markers. Yes, time and money. I love this job. Referent power, that's the last one. So these are the five sources of power that French and Raven, those two psychologists, developed. And, and 60 years later, all of us, those of us who study leadership, still see significant value in this typology. So legitimate power is positional. It always is. It says that you occupy a position in an organization. You could be a teacher. I hadn't thought about that example, but to some degree, I have legitimate power over you because I pick the textbook, I, I uh, make the assignments, I, I present content, I'm the person who evaluates you. So in a, in a positional situation, if you simply look at us in this relationship of instructor-student, I have legitimate power. Um, over students, and there's nothing bad or evil about that. So legitimate power is positional. Any one of you that's ever worked in any organization has either head power because of a position that you occupied, or you were accountable to someone who had power, like a manager that had oversight, um, that sort of thing. So legitimate power is positional. Now, reward power simply says that you, in some sort of a role, can reward people who report to you. And rewards can take so many forms. If we just thought about extrinsic rewards, if you work for me and I'm well pleased, can I promote you? Can I give you a raise? Can I perhaps give you a bonus? Can I, how about intrinsic stuff? Can I assign you to some neat project? Or working with some, someone on, on something that really energizes you? So th the truth is this reward power can either be extrinsic, um, uh, some sort of an event that has a calculable value, some discernible economic value, or it could be intrinsic. I could, I could assign you to something that really matters to you. So my point is that a second source of power in the French and Raven uh, typology is reward power. Now, here's something that not is necessarily fascinating, but it's worth discussing. Coercive power is the power to punish. Now, you could legitimately say, well, gosh, if I'm a manager anywhere and I have the power to reward someone, isn't coercive power just the flip side of that coin? Could I punish them? The answer is not always. Oftentimes, companies have significant structural impediments to you punishing somebody. You may be able to say to me, like if I'm a bad actor, let's assume I keep showing up late, or I have a crappy attitude, or whatever it is, I'm not a contributor. You may take me aside and say, look, Norton, you, this, cannot, this cannot continue. Uh, you have to improve. Here are the things that you're doing poorly. Here are the changes I expect you to make. So what you're doing, in a legitimate sense, is you're counseling me, aren't you? You're telling me that my behavior is unacceptable. Here's the standard to which I'm held, and here's the path for me to get from unacceptable to, to good behavior. So my point is that you may not be able to punish me in the sense that you can't fire me, demote me, transfer me, send me to, send me to New Jersey. My gosh, what a scary thought. Yes, those are scary people. Yeah. Um, if you're from New Jersey, I love you. But the state of New Jersey is a shithole. And I'm sure there's a nicer way to say that, but I'm not gonna look for it. Um, I turned down a job there once a very good job when I learned about the restrictions on practically on firearms and hunting and things like that. It is the People's Republic of New Jersey. Yes, it is. So, <clears throat> coercive power says you have the power to punish. Now, oftentimes you do. It, to the extent that, that I work for you and I'm an underperformer, you may be able to punish me. You may be able to assign me the jobs that are crappy. You may stop delegating things to me that would be developmental or energizing. You may very well be able to demote me, fire me, reassign me, do all sorts of stuff. But my point is that it strikes most of us that reward power and coercion power are flip sides of the same coin, but oftentimes managers can neither reward nor punish. 
because there are all these structural things in an organization that HR has to insert itself and take a role to make sure that things are done competently, legally, that sort of thing. As long as you get it, that reward power is precisely what it says it is, and coercive power is the power to punish. These are the five sources of power, again, that French and Raven talk about. Now, the other two, expert power. Clearly, in some domain, you have expertise. I saw my primary care physician on Friday. Okay, in the, in the context of internal medicine, that man has expertise that I lack. He has education, training. When I say training, I mean things like, like residencies and internships, and the fact that he's been practicing, I guess, for 22 years. So he has education, formal training, and a great deal of experience. In that domain, he knows much more than I do. Uh, many of us have cars that are just loaded up with electronics. Yeah, well, I'm pretty comfortable with mechanical stuff. If you put a wrench in my hand or a rifle, I'm pretty comfortable. But I'm not good with electronics. So if anything on any of my vehicles goes south and it's electronic, it goes straight to J.C. Lewis and those competent people with their diagnostic tools and software patches and that sort of stuff will find and fix the problem. So car mechanics have expert power. CPAs have expert power. I'm a recovering CPA. I practiced for 17 years. I taught on the faculty of the American Institute. So there was no question that, that I was a high-speed practitioner. But the reality is I've been out of public practice for 30 years. I would not dream of doing my own tax return. No. I cheerfully will pay hundreds of dollars to a CPA to, to do that because a CPA who is in practice has expertise. She or he knows things about tax law that I don't. And then referent power. Referent power, I don't know. I've always believed that this is the, the most difficult to comprehend of these five sources, but yet at the end of the day, I don't really think it is. The root word of referent power is refer. To whom do you refer? Who stands as a model for you? Referent power says that in your lives, in all of our lives, there is someone, there may be two or three people, who are so significant to us, we want to emulate their behavior. We want to match them or be better than them on every dimension. Uh, there have been three men in my life, actually, who had referent power over me. Um, and, and, and for me to talk about that is not really significant to this conversation. But what I'm saying to you is there are people in my life that are, who's, who's, are so significant to me, I want to model my behavior after them. That's what referent power is. To whom do you refer? Who stands out as a role model for you? And clearly, if, if any person has referent power over any of us, that's a, a form, a very pure form of power, isn't it? Power in the sense that they can influence outcomes. If I identify someone as a referent person, I'm gonna model my behavior after that person. So she or he is positively influencing my, uh, my life, my, my trajectory. So I actually put these five sources of power on the board in those two columns purposefully. I wanted to make them big enough so that you could read them as you, as you sit there behind your device, whatever it is that you're doing. But here's a reality that I want to share with you. And French and Raven didn't make this distinction, but I think it's a useful one. The, um, the observation that I simply want to make is legitimate power, reward power, and coercive power fundamentally are all, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> fundamentally they're all positional. Some position in an organization gives you reward power or coercive power or legitimate power. Now, I don't get to reward you or punish you, do I? Um, pretty rare circumstances for either of those things to happen. You earn grades and, and I don't punish people. But my point is that legitimate power, reward power, and coercive power all reside in some position in an organization. Expert power and referent power are uniquely personal. They reside in an individual. And again, I just, I just wanted to make that distinction. So you're looking at French and Raven's 1961 typology, the five sources of power. Now, I'm on page 541. Let me jump there so that I can, my poor little pea brain can't do this from memory. 
On 541 of the text, this is table 14.2. Table 14.2 of the text is literally styled as influence tactics. And there are perhaps 11 of them shown? No, nine of them shown. But uh, here's my point. If we, if we go back to the definition of, of leadership, which says that a leader intentionally influences a group of collaborators to accomplish some shared task. What we're doing is we're using influence tactics to get the members of the group. Now, the reality is different group members might require different influence tactics. And we'll talk about that actually later today because we'll talk about a theory called leader member exchange. But the point is what this table does is it sets forth nine common techniques of influencing people in organizations. I want you to know that there are only really two of them that I like. Um, and I'll tell you why. So let me run through them for just a moment. The very first one, rational persuasion, that is actually my gold standard. If I'm in a leadership role and you're in my team, every single time that, that I have to make a decision and implement one on something we're gonna do as a group, I'm gonna tell you the task, what the objective is, what I think the best approach is, and then I'm gonna actively seek your perspective. I want this to be a collaborative decision. So my point is, I'm gonna, when it says rational persuasion, I'm not gonna tug on harsh dreams. I'm not gonna say, if it just saves one kitty cat. I'm gonna lay this thing out rationally. Here's what we must do. Here are the resources that we have. Here's the approach I think is best. Now you critique it. Tell me if you agree with me, if you wanna modify something, whatever the case may be. But my point is, I want you to make a thoughtful, deliberate decision that yes, what we're doing is smart, or no, I wanna stick my hand in the air and say, six, I think we should do something else. So my point is that I have a strong bias in any leadership role, any leadership role, academic, military, church, anywhere, to use this technique, this influence technique called rational persuasion. I wanna lay out a path and suggest to you that I think it's best, and I'll tell you why, but I, I want your input. So that takes this rational persuasion and it adds this, this other dimension of collaborative decision making, doesn't it? Because I wanna hear from you. Now the other one that I like, and you'll see why I like this, it is number three in the list, and it's consultation. I'm gonna consult with you if I'm in a leadership role. Well, that's what collaborative decision making is, isn't it? I almost universally pair rational persuasion and consultation. I wanna tell you what the task is, share with you what I think is the best approach, and ask for your active participation. Now think about that. In the first place, it's motivational, because if I ask for your input, you know that I value you. You know that I regard you as a, as a contributing member of this team. That's a big deal, it is. You know that I respect your, your, your past contributions and I value your input and your opinion. So that's a big thing from a motivational perspective. The second thing that might even be a bigger thing is if I actively solicit your perspective on anything, I'm not gonna do some, some dumb butt thing. I'm not gonna neglect something that should be obvious, but it wasn't to me, because I have the benefit of your contribution of your critical thinking. And I can promise you, any decision that you and I make collectively, any decision that we make together is going to be vastly better in terms of its decision quality than any decision I make alone. Because I get to benefit from the collective wisdom and experiences of everybody in the group. So big fan of rational persuasion coupled with consultation because that to me, that to me is collaborative decision making. You take those two influence tactics and you smush them together and you get collaborative decision making. Now, there are others that, that are probably okay in certain contexts. Let me tell you some that uh, all the others I think are, are compromised in some way. Here, here's one, ingratiation. That's a fancy word for sucking up to you. Uh, not uh, exchange. If you do this for me, I'll do that for you. I think that's what hookers do, isn't it? Isn't that an exchange relationship? Um, Pressure, are you kidding me? That's when the team lead says, my way or the highway. Now, I can envision situations where something is just critical. 
For example, I want you to think about, pretend that I'm, that I'm Dr. Norton, the trauma surgeon, and I'm the team lead in, in a trauma team in some, some ER somewhere here in the United States. I'm the team lead. Somebody comes in with a, with a terrible trauma wound. I don't know if it was from a car accident, knife fight, gunshot, don't have any idea. Um, might have eaten something that wasn't gluten-free, terrible trauma wound. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so my point is, I can see someone in that situation who has domain expertise and who has this two things. You've got time compression, you may only have minutes to save this patient's life, and you have criticality of task. This person's life is on the line. This is not a dermatologist telling you to put something topical on the zit and everything will look great by prom. This is something that is, that is both time compressed and has critical outcomes. So I can see someone saying, do this now. No opportunity for collaboration. I'm the team lead of a trauma team. I'm, I'm formally trained, I've got lots of experience. I make this assessment and I start barking out orders. I think that's exactly what the other members of the, of the trauma team would want. They want someone who has that sort of domain expertise to make those decisions and give them a task and then we do it together. So what I'm saying is I actually can envision some situations where pressure, where simply telling you that you must do something now is the right thing, but that would be pretty rare. Put yourself in a business setting. There's no loss of life. Nothing is going to happen terrible in the next two minutes or four hours. So, so doing that in an organizational context is, is just pretty goofy. So my point is that I know I'm giving you my bias. I know that. But my bias is, is well-informed. It's well-informed intellectually and it's well-informed experientially. Uh, of the nine influence tactics, everything except, in my view, everything except rational persuasion and consultation is compromised to some degree. It oftentimes will have an unintended outcome. So please, just be aware of the fact that there's a good body of literature. This is actually a pretty useful thing. I don't think you should ever sell this book. Um, this is a pretty useful thing that you might want to consider working in an organizational context. This book could be a resource for you because you could say, boom, all of a sudden I'm a team lead. I remember this stuff from Manager 3130, but I didn't take the leadership course, daggum. Where can I go get some guidance, get a jump start? So again, I, I just wanted you to understand that uh, that's uh, sort of the perspective. Now, I'm on 470, and there's a conversation about the difference between managers and leaders. I'm not going to take that up right here, right now, because I discuss and develop that meaningfully in that other video, the one that is, that is entitled Leadership and Overview. That's a big piece of it. What you'll discover, if you don't know this already, because you're early stage B-School kids, what you'll discover is leaders and managers, to do them well, do different things. Leaders don't do the same thing that managers do. To do these different things well requires different skill sets. So it's quite rare for anybody at the same moment in time be in a managerial role and to exhibit leadership behaviors. Very difficult. It may be possible, but it's incredibly difficult. But again, I'm going to defer that discussion now because I take it up meaningfully in, in, the, uh, in the companion video. So now on 545, and I love this, there's a discussion of dark side traits. Well, this won't surprise you. Most of the time when we talk about leadership, we talk about what those things that are classically called bright side traits, the things that are virtuous, the things that are good, the things that everybody really likes. Uh, if I'm humble, if I'm authentic, you see my point? Who would not want someone in a leadership role who legitimately shows humility and, and, and is authentic in everything she or he does? I mean, those are fabulous traits, aren't they? But clearly, since there are bright side traits in leadership, there are dark side traits. Some people use the power that accrues to them in a leadership role for very, very evil purposes. Yes, happens on a regular basis. So there are three talked about in the text, and, and actually there's a great deal of research on this. Dave Sikora and I right now are doing a paper on, on abusive leadership, uh, recognizing that, that it does exist, and we are literally studying the very things that, that are talked about in this book. So the, the three traits are Machiavellianism, narcissism and, and psychopathy. 
So if anyone is Machiavellian, that means that in that person's view of the world, the ends justify the means. I can do anything at all to you if I get the outcome that I think is desirable. Okay, not many of us will go down that road. Uh, politicians do that on a regular basis, I promise you. That's not a cynical observation. But you look at politics over the entire history. Machiavelli was a prince in Italy, and it was written in about the, gosh, the 15th century. And the stuff, I read it recently because of this paper I'm doing with Sakura, and, and the stuff that was talked about six, 700 years ago resonates because I see it today. I see it in past White Houses. I see it in the halls of Congress. I see it everywhere. Machiavellianism says that if you are a believer, if that is your approach, if you possess that dark side trait, that you believe that the ends justify the means. If I get the desired result, I don't give a crap what happens or to whom in the process. The ends justify the means. Generally bad strategy, yeah. Narcissism, I wish we could do this together. I, I treasure interaction and I don't like talking to an iPad mini, or is it mini? I'm not sure. For the same reason, I don't know if that wine that we drink at home is Chablis or Chablis. Pinky's out, just don't know. So, narcissism is love of self. Are you kidding me? There are so many people that are narcissistic. Napoleon is the classic example. Um, when would this have been? I don't remember. Let's call it the winter of 1813. Napoleon was defeated by Wellington at Waterloo in 1815. Before that, Napoleon invaded Russia. And I apologize, I should have checked. But Napoleon marched an army of 540,000 French soldiers into Russia to, to depose the monarch. He just didn't like his behavior, it was the Tsar, I think didn't like his behavior and thought he could crush him militarily because he was unbelievably, he, Napoleon, was unbelievably arrogant. Well, Napoleon didn't plan on the Russian winter. He didn't plan on the tenacity of Russian soldiers and his entire army. I think, I think 10,000 men out of 540,000 returned to France. He lost his entire army because of his arrogance, his narcissism, his love of self. So while this is going on, while everybody's dying from cold weather and starvation and, and uh, battle casualties, Napoleon sends a cable back to Paris and it says, it, it was just one sentence in length, it said, your emperor's health has never been better. That's what it said, one sentence. Your emperor's health has never been better. I'm in great shape. Those poor sons of a guns that are getting, you know, dying of malnutrition and frostbite and stuff like that, who gives a crap? I'm good. I'm important. Narcissism is love of self, and, and it is just, it, it's so bad, it's a dark side trait. Nothing good about narcissism. The last one is psychopathy. Okay. Um, the classic definition of, of a psychopath is one who possesses both of those other traits, Machiavellianism and narcissism. But, but, added to those two, a psychopath has zero empathy. No respect for life, law, no consideration for other people, nothing. Zero empathy. And the behaviors of a psychopath are always deliberate. They're always planned. Every school shooter that has ever stepped in a building with the intent of killing anyone is a psychopath. Zero empathy, deliberate planning. So again, sad stuff, but uh, it is well, though, that, that you know that we typically talk, talk only about the good side of leadership, these bright side values, but there's a dark side. And this won't surprise you, sometimes people in leadership roles exhibit both qualities simultaneously. Uh, bright side traits and dark, they often coexist. Uh, way too many people love themselves. Uh, can you say Instagram? Yes. I was gonna have an account there as a fashion influencer, but you had to sign some agreement that says you have to show side boob. I didn't want to do that. So I, I decided not to have an Instagram influencer account. I guess for me that would have meant a, a tank top. Don't know. Who cares? 
Elon Musk, the founder and CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, and now the owner of Silver City. I am convinced, I am convinced Elon Musk has, has a bundle of bright side traits and dark side traits. I'm convinced of it. I mean, I've watched the man's behavior and I just think no rational human being would ever make public statements like you just made, Elon. But he does on a regular basis. And again, I'm just, I'm just saying that I think he is an example, a contemporary example, one that is larger than life, of someone in a leadership role in which bright side traits and dark side traits simultaneously coexist. Pretty sure he's a good, uh, good example of that. Now, the whole significance on traits, the reason that we haven't really talked about many bright side traits, we've talked more about dark side, but uh, we'll get to them in a moment, some other good ones. But what smart firms will do if they have a well-staffed and competent HR department, before people are chosen for leadership roles, the, the HR people will make an assessment of traits. There are all sorts of valid and, and reliable uh, instruments and measures for these traits. Wouldn't it make sense that, that, that I can, and I know they exist because I'm doing research in that domain right now, there are measures for Machiavellianism, narcissism, psychopathy. Uh, if I'm in HR, I promise you, before I select you for a leadership role, you're gonna take this little test. And, and if we can discern that you have a strong bias towards dark side traits, no, we are not gonna pick you for a leadership role. So my point is that firms can select people for leadership roles or deselect them, take them out of consideration based on the traits that they exhibit. Now, I want to jump now to traits clearly are personological because the definition of a trait is a stable predisposition to behave across multiple circumstances. Think about the traits that you possess that are virtuous. Are you persistent? Head down, grind it out, get it done. Are you loyal? Are you punctual? Are you cheerful? Think of all the traits that are virtuous, that, that that are bright side, that would, that would carry you far in life. So my point is traits are personological in the sense that we all have hundreds of them. But my point is in the context of leadership, and that is today's conversation, smart firms have HR departments that, that just are you know, equipped with or staffed with enough bright people to make these evaluations, to make these assessments. If we're considering somebody for a leadership role, not, not a promotion managerially or from junior account to senior account. Those are technical domains, aren't they? But if we're considering somebody for a leadership role, we would deselect, wouldn't we? We would not choose them if they exhibit dark side traits. We'd be crazy in the head to, to choose them and then let them advance and work their evil on uh, people in our organization. So I want to step away now from traits. I'm on 550 in the text, and I want to start talking about leader behaviors. So I need some board space. I, I think that I addressed this subject also in the leadership video, the overview, but this is a, we are, you and I together now are talking about chapter 14 of the text. So we are specifically talking about leader behaviors, not traits, the way people behave, we, we can observe these behaviors. So here's what the leadership literature says. By the way, this comes from Ohio State University. Um, really, really bright group of scholars there decades ago, probably in the early 50s, had studied returning servicemen. Uh, about 18 million or so servicemen came back in uh, the late 40s when World War II hostilities ended and they were reintegrated in society. But many of them had been in leadership roles in combat or were impacted by the decisions of people in leadership roles. So the folks at Ohio State started studying leadership using that sort of as a, as a platform. They didn't limit themselves to that. And they did, they did studies for probably eight years or so and came to the conclusion that there are two behaviors that predict effective leadership. One, do you have a task orientation? Can you get the job done? That requires that you have 
you have domain knowledge, you know how to do something, whatever the something is. You know, can we rebuild a tank engine? Can we, can we get uh, the stuff, the material that we're storing here out to retail locations? You know, the, the classical logistics and supply chain management task. So can you get the job done? That's what a task orientation is. And, and it means that you know the domain and you know how to schedule things and you can guide people, maybe even train them. But do you have strong knowledge it would permit you to get the task done. The relational behaviors is radically different because it asks a different question. It says, are you considerate of your people? You actually build relationships with them. Do you care? Now, I want you to think about something because I'm going to use a goofy example, but I think it'll, I think it'll carry this conversation. Let's pretend, <clears throat> since there are about 45 or 50 in this class, that all of us collectively belong to one infantry platoon or an active duty, we are infantrymen. And, and, uh, and I happen to be the platoon leader. So I'm gonna create a goofy situation where I'm high on task and low on relational behaviors. So our battalion commander says, Norton, you and your soldiers have to take that objective. It's critical, we can't move forward until we get it. So I'm pretending that I'm high on task and low on relational, and I get the job done, but I get every one of you killed or wounded. Got the job done, right? High on task low on relational behaviors. Who among you would ever follow me again into combat? None of you would. Because that Bill Morton doesn't give a crap about you. He proved it. High on task, low on relational. Now, let me invert those, let me flip them. Let's pretend we get the same mission, but I'm, I'm Lieutenant Cupcake. Uh, I, I don't have any, I have, I'm really, really low on task, but very, very high on relational behaviors. And I say to you, to all of us, Y'all, let's get in a circle and hold hands and discover the inner children in ourselves. And then we'll take a vote. And we may take a vote and it might be 23 to 22 against, so we just don't do anything. We just sit in a circle and, and sing Kumbaya or whatever it is that we do. Always a good choice. Always a good choice. We get the s'mores out. So in that situation, did we take the objective that was critical? No, because I'm really low on task and, and, and overly I score way too high on relational behaviors. So the point that I'm moving towards is these two behaviors, what you want to be always to be an effective leader, and it doesn't matter what the context is. You want to be high on task and high on relational behaviors. If I'm your platoon leader, we have to take that same objective. I'm going to put a plan in place. I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to say, here's the task. Here are the risks that I know that we can mitigate. There are some that we simply have to expect, have to, have to take on. There's some risks that we have to accept because we are soldiers, we're infantrymen, we've got to get that objective. But I'm not going to squander your lives. I'm not going to do anything that's stupid or foolish, whatever the case may be. So I'm pretty sure you follow that Bill Norton. If that Bill Norton were high on task, you and I together get the job down and I show you that I authentically care about you. I'm going to mitigate any risk that I possibly can. I'm going to make sure that we have a ready reaction force, that we've got medics that can get to us if people get injured, whatever the case may be, wounded. Um, so my point is that oftentimes planning can, can compensate for, for, for bad decisions. Gee, imagine that. So the point that I'm making, though, is this, this has been a literature since, gosh, 1953. That is as robust, as intellectually strong today as it was when the Ohio State scholars first published it. The two types of behaviors that predict effective leadership are, are you high on task-related behaviors? Are you high on relational behaviors? If you are in a leadership role and you score high, I promise you, it doesn't matter what the context is, you will be successful. You will be effective. Uh, and, and that is, uh, that's big stuff. Um, now, a lot more I'd like to tell you about that, but I'll make one comment before I step away from this. Since these are behaviors, they can be both measured, we can get measures on them, and their skills, and that means that they're transferable. So what if, what if you're, you're high on consideration but low on task behaviors? Can we train you on stuff that's job related? Heck yes. What if you're high on task and low on uh, relational behaviors? Can we teach you about conflict resolution and negotiation and org behavior and all sorts of other things? We can. So my point is that these two behaviors are just that, they're not traits. They're not baked in. If we're not high, high, we can grow those skills. These are transferable skills and they can be taught. And that's huge. That is absolutely huge. So now 
Um, I want to talk to you about mentoring because I think it's mentioned in the text, but there's not a good, uh, I don't think there's a good development of it. Let me tell you about mentoring in ways that I hope will benefit you. <clears throat> mentoring is a relationship between two counterparties, the mentor and the protege. If you ever hear anybody say mentee, walk away from them because they don't know their right hand from their left. It's mentor and protege, not mentor and mentee. If you hear mentee, you know you're talking to a dud. Leave the conversation. So it's a counterpart, forgive me, it's a relationship between two counterparts. The mentor is typically senior in an organization, and she or he has extensive knowledge of whatever that domain is. And what that means is that she or he has wisdom, has perspective, that can only come from immersion, from years of experience. The protege is typically new to the organization. She or he is usually a fresh face. That's going to be you in a few months, isn't it? So here's what I want you to do, and I mean this. I want you to do this. I beg you to do this. The moment that you put your boots on the ground somewhere, the moment that you join an organization, please actively search for a mentor. And you may swing and miss. Uh, here's, a, here's sort of a path that, that you could go. Let's say you're a marketing major. I don't know what you are right now, but you're a marketing major and you get a, an early career job in marketing with some company, Inc. Don't care who it is. So you're the, you're the fresh face, you're the new kid. You've just joined the organization. You've been there 31 days, 45 days, whatever the case may be. Immediately start a search. And I would, I would look at the people who are senior to you, not the next level up, not your boss. They're not generally gonna be mentors, generally. I want you to look one or two levels beyond that. So look two or three levels up in the organization. Look at the people who are the vice presidents of marketing or someone who has significant responsibilities for a region or product line or somebody who's been there for 10, 12, 15 or more years. Somebody who has a great deal of experience and a great deal of perspective. And when you can, this could be you sending an email, this could be you bumping into them at the company cafeteria or the daily grind if you're still in Statesboro. The first opportunity you have, introduce yourself and say, hey, I'm brand new, been here 60 days, I'm a, I'm a marketing kid. I, I wonder if, if I might visit with you occasionally if I have questions about marketing. And, and there are some people who are cranky. They just had nails for breakfast and they'll say, heck no. But most people have a heart, yes, and, and uh, it's not two sizes too small like the Grinch. Most people say, I'd be glad to help you, reach out. So the point is, you've at least, you made an introduction, you introduced yourself to this person who is senior to you, but in the same discipline, and she or he has expressed a willingness to help. Well, take advantage of it. Don't wear them out. Meet them for coffee somewhere, go to them with a specific question. But my point is that since they have perspective, a mentor will guide you. She or he will say, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, please. The mentor will say, oh no, please don't consider that. That's a, that's a career killer, for whatever the reasons are. Or, I've learned of an opportunity, now, and I want to suggest that you at least explore this. At some point, this mentoring relationship may very well become a powerful interpersonal relationship. When I say powerful, I mean that the mentor will realize that you are very promising, that you're a rising star, that you have heart, that you have a good attitude, you have a good work ethic, Skills will come. We can train for skills, but if you have a bad attitude, you're a zero right now. No, there's no discussion of that. If I were in that situation that I have been, I would invest 10 minutes in you if I thought you had a bad attitude. Um, I, can't, I, can't, I can't teach attitude, I can't train you for that. I can train you for skills. I can open doors for opportunities, but I can't give you a good attitude. If you don't have one, I'm not gonna invest any time and, and I don't know how many others feel the same way. But my point is that when I say this interpersonal relationship will grow, if you have these interactions with a mentor and she or he sees promise in you, what I said just a moment ago, good work ethic, good attitude, promising, looking forward, big heart, oh, gosh, there's a high probability that that mentor will invest in you significantly, will keep you from making bad decisions, will guide you to things, will we'll kick doors open, will make phone calls, will say, you know, I know you have an open position, you need to look at this kid, whomever this kid is. So mentors are powerful because they keep you from making bad decisions and they guide you to good ones. Oftentimes, 
A mentoring relationship that starts early career may span decades. You two may both leave the company. You may change industries, but oftentimes those mentoring relationships endure. I just want you to understand how powerful it is, and I beg you, I mean that. The day, the day that you put your boots on the ground in some organization, start looking around for a mentor. And, and this, this, grad, you know, this, this uh, thoughtful, simple introduction, along with what you think you need, could I visit with you from time to time as I have questions in accounting, marketing, logistics, whatever it is that you are. They may say no. And you may, you may have someone say yes, and then you discover that that, that potential mentor is never available. Travels too much, high level meetings all the time. Okay, you swung and you missed, look for somebody else. Look for somebody who will invest the time in you to help grow you, to help develop you. Big stuff. Big stuff. All right, on 568, new theory called LMX, Leader Member Exchange. This thing is so powerful, I, I just can't tell you how significant it is. So here's what LMX theory says. It's been in literature for a long time. I have seen this operate everywhere I have ever worked. Business, military, whatever the case may be. Academia, everywhere I've ever worked, I've seen this. Leader Member Exchange says that every member of the group, every team member, self-selects, she or he decides, alone, no influence, to either have a high quality relationship with a team lead or a low quality relationship. Example, I'm the new team lead and you're there and you have a good attitude and you say, you know, I'm gonna help this guy however I can. I've got several years experience, he's brand new to the team, doesn't know dynamics, there'll be a lot of learning. I'm gonna help this new team lead. So you have decided to have a high quality relationship. Here's another person, here's your evil twin brother or sister, Skippy. Skippy's a unisex name. So your evil twin sibling, Skippy, says, screw this Norton guy. Nobody took me aside, nobody helped me. He can learn this stuff himself. I'll do what I'm asked to do, that and only that. Okay, there's that tiny heart, the Grinch heart. Two, two, what is it, two sizes under size or whatever the, whatever the case was in that classic Christmas show. So what LMX says properly, correctly, is that every member of every team self-selects. The member with no influence from anybody else decides to either engage in a high quality relationship with the team lead or low quality. The members of the team self-select. That's not responding to what the team lead does, that's the members choosing. Now, this won't surprise you. The team members who select to have a high quality relationship flourish. They're, they're put in opportunities. If I'm the team lead and, and you have heart, I'm gonna delegate stuff to you, grow you, develop you, do anything I can to help you. And yes, the team benefits, but you benefit significantly, don't you? Because I'm the team lead and I invested in you. Time, energy, emotion, whatever the case may be. So high quality relationships, LMX relationships, mean good relationships with the team leader. Low quality relationships mean terrible or no relationships. You're there, you're a worker bee. You, you don't reach out, you don't have heart, you don't care. Uh, you have already told me that I can expect minimum effort from you and you never disappoint me. So, team members that decide unilaterally to engage in a high quality relationship are the in-group and team members who choose unilaterally to have a low quality relationship are in the out group. Do you see the division, the hostility? The out group people are gonna say, those sons of guns, they get all the good assignments, Norton loves them, and, and he, you know, he doesn't do anything bad to me, but he doesn't invest in me. Okay, you picked, you decided, low quality or high quality. But the point is, the people who do that create two groups, an in group and an out group, and those two groups exist in tension. There's hostility between them. So, having ridden that pony on several occasions, I'm convinced that everyone that ever takes on a leadership role needs to identify the people in the group that have chosen to have a low quality relationship and invest in them. Do everything that you can to convert them from a low quality relationship into a high quality relationship. Because, this won't surprise you to hear me say this, leadership is a contact sport. 
Leaders have to have regular, direct interaction with every member of the team. Not just the neat kids who have heart, but everybody. And, and if I'm a team lead and, and I invest in you, you think, maybe this guy's not so much of a jerk after all. Maybe I'll start contributing. Maybe I'll start you know, putting the team's needs ahead of my own. Great leaders, whether I don't care if the team is four people or much larger than that, great leaders get rid of, of in-groups and out-groups. Everybody has a high quality relationship with the team lead. That's precisely what great leadership is. And I don't care how small or how big the group is. So my point is, LMX theory is right, darn it. This doesn't have to happen initially, but every member of every team chooses to either have a high quality relationship with the team lead or low quality. Nobody influences that choice. They individually make that decision. But that creates tension, hostility, a gap. And the gap has to be closed. And in my view, that responsibility is on the team lead. You know who's in an out group, who's in the low quality relationship, invest in them. Regular, direct interaction. And grow them into a high quality relationship. Last topic, there is, there is no page number, humility. I. Uh, I can't tell you how significant that is to leadership. Um, I can promise you that humility is a high order goal of mine. It's something that I aspire to on an hourly basis. I could never say to you that I'm humble, I've, I've done it. Because wouldn't I be arrogant when I said that? That would be. Um, one of the things that, that I, I find it impossible, impossible, to divorce humility from authenticity. And the reason I say that is, if I'm in a leadership role, and you have the sense that I am authentic, that I care about you, that I'm willing to admit mistakes, that I'm willing to take ownership of everything in this team, and to the extent that I have the power, I'll make it better. Whether that is training or resources or collaborative decision-making or whatever it may be. This thing about ownership, if you're in a, in, in a leadership role, is pretty powerful stuff. I want you to consider this. Um, I'm not a big fan of popular press books. Uh, I've had people ask, ask me often because I've taught and done research and leadership for so many years, what I recommend. I finally have one that I would recommend. It's a popular press book. Most popular press books, the people are just sharing their opinions and they just want to make money and I get that. That doesn't distress me at all. But uh, about five years ago, two SEALs who served together in, uh, in Iraq in, in probably the most hostile environment imaginable um, in probably like the 2006 era when, when uh, ISIS had control of the city, brutal murders all the time and, and uh, lots of ugly stuff going on. There were two SEALs that served there in leadership roles and they together wrote a book called Extreme Ownership. And it is precisely how Navy SEALs lead and win. And, and there are a lot of reasons that I think the book is an exceptional read if you have any interest in a popular press book about leadership. Every single chapter takes on a different topic, and that's that as well, that, that they make it that discreet. But the sort of the, the template for the book is the first part of the chapter will relate a story from their active combat experiences, and as they develop the story, they will identify what they did poorly or what they did well, and what they learn from it. So it starts with a, an anecdote, a story that is incredibly well presented, incredibly well developed, and it's well developed because they point out what they did wrong, what they learned, the lessons that they learned, that they integrate into future training, into future leadership environments. The second thing that they do once they develop that story and present it is they have a section of the chapter called the principle. What is it that we're talking about? And then the third part of the chapter, every chapter follows the same template, and they, they talk about application. They've had a vibrant consulting business, and, and the point is that they've taken these things that they've learned in a, in a wartime role, and they brought them to the domain of business or organizations. And, and they say, here was our experience in combat, here are the principles that it focuses on, here's one example of an excellent application. So I, I only rarely, rarely recommend popular press books, but extreme ownership. 
written by two sales. Their last names are Babin, B-A-B-I-N, and uh, Will Link, I think, W-I-L-L-I-N-K. But Extreme Ownership will get you there. Just a crazy good book if you are interested in something that's uncommonly well done and uncommonly practical. So, humility and authenticity can really only be assessed by other people. The only way I, I can't claim that I'm authentic, I want to be always, always. I want to be humble, always. I want to put my own needs, my own evaluation of self. Humility and authenticity can only be assessed or judged by other people with whom you interact. I can't imagine how, how humbling and satisfying it would be if I were a leadership role and all my people said, boy, the guy was really, he was genuine, he was authentic, and, and he was humble. No arrogance, no stepping out, no, all about me. Everything he did, power flowed from him outward to benefit us. I can't imagine how satisfying that would be to have people whom I have led to describe me as authentic and humble. But that's sort of my point, not me. My point is that we can't declare that we're either one. Those are simply goals. Their aspirations, their ideals, their things that we should be shooting for every single day. And if we are successful, the people with whom we interact will say, gosh, that woman really is authentic. She really is humble. So again, I have no, there's no clever path I can send you now. There's no, you know, you do these three things, you're gonna get all the marks. But boy, it's big stuff authenticity and humility. And as I said, I want to talk about them together. There are big streams of research and leadership, especially about authentic leadership. Surprisingly, less so about humility. But um, I cannot divorce them. I, I can't say humility and, authentic, and authenticity are somehow separate and distinct. I, I think that they, that, they, that they coexist. I don't think that you can divorce one from the other. So now, we are at the AVQ, the attendance verification question. Kind of pretty clever, AVQ, I'm sorry. I want to take you back to Southern Indiana, whatever, 15, 20 years ago. What did my precious wife Elaine ask me about the pickup truck that passed behind us? What was Elaine's question to me? All right, we're done for today. Love you. Talk to you all soon.